All right, I think we're at two o'clock and as soon as Mark is all set to go, he'll give us a thumbs up and we'll get started. Uh, just a quick check. Can everyone hear me out there? If you can hear me and you're on camera, give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Mark Mueller. I work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm going to be coming to you from my home today, probably into yours. And we are going to work on an activity today to together. And I'm also going to be working with my colleague, Tim, and he's in his home. So you'll be hearing a lot of talk between Mark and Tim. And then a little later on, we're also going to talk to a scientist that works with us at NCAR named Jeff. So. We've already seen that uh, we've got folks coming in from Boulder and Louisville, and that, so we're all in the same neighborhood. Thanks for saying hello, everyone. We're excited to have you here today, and we're gonna get started with our activity. So we're gonna be exploring how air behaves when it changes temperature, and then how that connects to the way clouds form. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to grab your bottle, and I want you to notice your bottle should not have anything in it, or in terms of nothing seems to pour out of it, but is there anything in your bottle? And you'll notice my bottle doesn't have a cap on it. I can poke my finger in there. So is there anything in there since nothing's pouring out of my bottle? Is our bottle's just empty? What do you think? Add your thoughts to chat. <laughs> yes, empty. We are sure that it's empty. Mine looks kind of empty too. And, you know, but there's one thing in here that we don't think about often because it's invisible. It's air. There's air in my bottle. Did you see anything in there? Well, no, but in, it does, it actually full, it's full of air and air is made up of these tiny molecules. So these tiny molecules have gone inside my bottle and they're so small, we can't see them, but they take up space and they are inside of there. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to find out how the air molecules behave inside of this bottle when we change their temperature from hot to cold. So first things first, we've got our bottle, it's empty, or is it? It's full of air, right? We've got a little dish of soap ready to go. I got a little rag if I make a mess. I've got my cold water, which is icy cold, so I'm going to put that now in my cold tank. And I've got my hot water, which I took out of a tea kettle, and I'm going to pour that in on this side. And why I do that, I want you to know that I have a really big difference in temperature, so I'm gonna measure them for you. On one side here, I have 39 degrees. And on the other side, I have 157 degrees. So a big difference in temperature. So get your hot and cold sides ready. They may already be. I just gotta pour all my hot water in there because I need all of it to warm up my bottle. There we go. All right, so let's do this together. You're gonna do this with me. So grab your bottle and give it a soap hat, which what I mean by that is stick it in the soap and pull it out of the soap. And on top of the bottle, you will see a little film of soap. That's now become the cap until I popped it. I accidentally touched it with my finger. You might do this too. You might have to go back to your soap dish often and start over by just dipping it into a little bit of soap until you see soap on top of your bottle. Okay, so now there's a little bit of soap on top of my bottle and it's kind of making a very gentle small bubble. You got that? Okay, so before the bubble breaks, let's take the bottle and just on its bottom part, put it in the hot side, put it in the hot water. Ready, go. Whoa, what's going on? My bubble popped. Yours might have popped too. And it's gonna be often that it pops maybe, so I'm gonna start over and try again. You might need to try again as well. Go ahead and re-dip that bottle in the soap and put it back in the hot water. It doesn't do anything. Well, mine's doing something. It's making a ginormous bubble. I and sometimes wow. it gets so big it pops. <laughs> yeah. Somebody says, wow. Oh my goodness. So see, wow, mine popped again. Awesome. So let's keep, let's keep practicing that hot side for a couple more tries until we can get those bubbles to rise and expand. Our bubbles are taking the air inside, they're warming up the air molecules with the heat, and they're expanding inside of the bubble. So that's why the bubble's getting bigger. And there was a question, did you add air to that bottle? I did not add air by myself personally. I let the air in this room press into the bottle because believe it or not, 
we have a lot of air pressure pressing against our body right now. It's around 13 and a half pounds per square inch at this level of height on the earth. So it's around 15 pounds per square inch at sea level. So the air in this room naturally pushed into this bottle and I trapped it by adding the soap to the top. And then that's why the air when warm pushes the soap in an expansive way. So just to be clear, I think it might not be perfectly clear. What did make that bubble expand? Yeah, what's making this bubble expand is not my hands, it's not me squeezing the bottle, because I'm not, it's the hot heat that went in here that came from my tea kettle. It warmed up the air inside of this bottle so much that the air molecules inside of there, even though they're invisible, started to spread out and expand. And that's why I had a bubble until just a second ago. It got so big, it popped. So I gotta start over again. So what I'd like everybody to do out there is now to try to make a warm bubble but don't let it pop. So I'm gonna let mine rise a little bit, but I'm not gonna let it go quite so far this time. And when it gets up about that high, or about, you know, as big as your thumb, go ahead and now take the bottle, pull it out carefully, and push it into the cold water. Where does the bubble go? It might have popped too. So you might have to confirm what happened and start over. Give it some fresh soap, give it some fresh expansion, and then put it into the cold tub and see why in the world your bubble seems to go away. Where does your bubble go? Oh, into the bottle it looks like we've discovered. Great. So I've noticed that too. Let's keep track, let's practice one more time. Let's go from hot, expanding, to cold. And on this side, we're going through contraction. The molecules are actually huddling together, getting tighter and closer together, and contracting down inside of the bottle. In fact, I can point with my finger that my bubble has gone down. One of them went down to this far. There's a line inside of my bottle and I can see where the bubble stopped. It went down all the way to where my finger is. Are you guys getting some of the same observations out there? Looks like we have a lot of experiments going on out there. And a yes, it looks like Boulder has a bubble going down. <laughs> Down on the cold side, yeah. Contracting on the cold side. Expanding on the hot side. And if you're careful and don't let the bubble break, you could actually go back and forth and make the bubble go up and down, kind of like an elevator. Cool. Well, from what I can see um, in the chat and what I've heard from Tim so far, it sounds like, it looks like you saw what I saw during this activity, is that when I put my bottle into the hot water, the bubble grew above the bottle. And when I put my bottle into the cold water, the bubble went down the mouth of the bottle. I bet you're wondering what made the bubbles do this. Well, remember, there's tiny little air molecules inside of there. And those tiny air molecules can actually change according to their temperature. So the hot water heats up the air molecules, they get warmer, they spread out and expand, and that's why the bubble grows. When the molecules expand inside your bottle, they take up more space, and this makes the bubble grow bigger on the hot side. Now, when you put your bottle on the cold side, the bubble moves down into the neck of the bottle, and this is because cold water cooled the air inside the bottle. And as the air gets colder, those molecules huddle together and go down. This is a word in science we call a contraction. These colder, water, these colder air molecules need less space. So that's why they can go down into a smaller part of the bottle. They sink down into the bottle and that's why the bubble behaves that way. So let's put our bottles down for a second. You can continue playing with this at home. Everybody try this again, but everybody put your bottle down for one second. And I'd like to see if you can show me with your body, with your arms, and with your legs, by standing up or standing up big or getting small, we're gonna practice what just happened in our bottle. So 
when the air got warmer, show me with your body what happened to your bubble. So when you did the hot side, what did your bubble do? Did it expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Mine got really big, maybe not that big, but it got pretty big. Now, let's pretend we got into the cold side and now we're in the cold water. Show me with your hands what happened to your bubble. Oh yeah, it's contracting and taking up less space and going down the neck of your bottle. I can't talk, it's in my neck. Okay, so you can see this is what we just acted out is exactly what the air molecules do inside this bottle. It's the same air that's going in my mouth, into my lungs and keeping me alive, but it can change the way weather works too. So now I'd like to introduce you to a scientist who's gonna talk about this activity and connect it to weather. His name's Jeff. Hi there, everybody. I'm going to explain to you kind of how this same idea works in the real world. Now, while, while we were looking at a, a bottle uh, filled with soap and hot and cold water, that's really what's going on outside in our, on our atmosphere today. So what, it's, this is very similar to the, the sun coming in and heating up the surface of the earth. And as the sun comes up and gets to the middle of the day and sends its radiation down to the earth, it warms the earth up very nicely. And that allows water in this lake and, and the hot air on the planet to rise on up. And so this red arrow is, is the warm air rising, just like the air rose in the bottle that you had earlier. And so as this warm air starts to expand and, and rise on up into the atmosphere, it gets higher up in the atmosphere where it's colder and it turns into a cloud. Now, as more warm air with, with warmth and moisture keeps going up and cooling down and creating water droplets that make this cloud, eventually there's so much water in this cloud that it can't hold it up anymore. And so now we have all this water droplets up in these clouds that get so heavy that they're gonna come down and they're gonna come down as either rain or snow or hail. And so then that water comes back down to the surface of the earth. And that's kind of what we call our water cycle. And so this process that we're looking at of air being colder and contracting and being warmer and expanding is really responsible for this part of getting the water from the ground up into the clouds and back down again. And it's also why we have mountain and valley winds and the same reason why we have winds along the coasts, um, ocean sea breezes. It's all based on the same concept that as warm, as the air warms, it expands and rises up into the atmosphere. And that creates all of these clouds and gives us our sea breezes. And so it's really a, a very basic concept of how the atmosphere works. And sometimes we have these cool lightnings, lightning bolts out of these thunderstorms as well. That's, that's one of my favorite things about weather is seeing the severe weather and the tornadoes and, and lightning bolts like this. It's all very exciting. Um, these are probably my favorite types of clouds. Um, I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions that you might be able to ask of me today. It doesn't have to be about this topic. It can be about anything about weather. Thanks for helping us understand how this all works in the atmosphere. And like Jeff said, he's a meteorologist and he's ready to take your questions about what you've done. Or you can even ask him a little bit about his own work, what he does as a scientist. And Jeff, we did have a question about water in the freezer expanding because it's cold and air expanding. Is, are they the same or is that does air water expand in the freezer for, uh, is it different, is it the same as air? Do air yeah, and water it's, behave it's the same? It's a different process and, and water is kind of magical in that way. Um, most substances contract when they're cold. Um, water is one of the few things that expands when it freezes. Um, and also water is very magical in, in a number of ways. It also is not, it's densest when it's, it's frozen. So that's why ice floats on the top of, of liquid water which is unusual compared to all the other materials we have on earth. Everything else when it gets frozen sinks to the bottom. But if water behaved that way, we wouldn't have any fish because the <laughs> lakes would all freeze from the bottom up. So we're thankful. The fish are very thankful that water is kind of this special uh, substance that kind of behaves differently than all the other substances on earth. And so water does expand when it gets cold, but it's one of the few, if not the only substance that does that on this planet. 
Ah, and we do, thank you. We do have another question about forecasters. Uh, how do weather forecasters use information to predict weather? What's that look like when they, when they take measurements and what, sure. how do they use it to get to predict the weather? That, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Now, in relationship to what we were doing today, when we see areas of the country that we know are going to get a lot of sunshine and kind of heat up the surface, we can forecast that we're probably going to be seeing some sort of cloud development over that area because that warm air is going to want to rise and then cool down and make clouds. And so that is something that we look at in our forecasts. There are a lot of other variables that we look at doing our forecasting as well, like how close are we to water and moisture sources because water is a very important part about weather. There really isn't any weather without water. And so that's also very important. But uh, to expand on the principle that we saw today, when we know where there's areas of a lot of sunshine, we can expect a lot of air parcels to warm and expand and rise and create clouds. And so that is definitely a, a part of our forecasting process. It looks like we're still having some fun out there and doing some exploring. Yeah, my fellow science enthusiasts out there, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us something that you really enjoy about your job? Sure, I, I love working at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, my field work was on the Greenland ice sheet, and I was able to install automated weather stations all along the Greenland ice sheet. And that's still bringing back data today so we can see how the ice sheets are changing. Um, another part that I really enjoy about my job is that we deliver real-time data to universities and research institutions all across the planet, and then 3D visualization tools so that people can look at the weather in real time and make better forecasts and do better science. And so it's really great to be able to uh, help science serve society and, and reach out to the community and, and um, share our science to, to everybody. Wow, that's really wonderful. I'm glad that you offer this for, what, researchers all over the world? Is that? Yeah, yeah, all, all across the planet. It's not just the United States, and we, we serve the entire, country, the entire globe. Ah, well, guess what? We have a question about the Greenland ice sheet. What is an ice sheet? And can you walk on top of that? Wow, those are really fun questions. And, and so the ice sheet is a sheet of ice. And it's been there for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, when I was putting towers on the ice sheet, I was walking on ice that was over two miles thick, over 10,000 feet thick. And so, yeah, it's been there for a long time. And it's going to be there for a long time as well. But it is starting to change. and It is starting to melt. And so that's kind of a... Uh, an interesting place where we're looking at the changes of our climate um, because the, the ice at the poles is changing rather dramatically. But when we were on the ice sheet, it was like being on another planet. There weren't any animals at all because there's no food for the animals. So we didn't even see birds. Um, so there was literally no animals or plants on top of the Greenland ice sheet. We're about two, two and a half miles above the planet, just separated by ice. And there's a, it's like a landscape you can't imagine. It's all you can see is white, uh, and, and in the sky. And so it's, it's a very interesting place to be, but it's a very important place for us right now to study climate and climate change. And, and when you say climate or weather, what's a good way to remember the difference between climate and weather? I love this phrase, the saying that I often use, and that is climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Oh. So <laughs> climate is kind of the average weather that you get over that time period for about 30 years is how we average a climate time. And so that's kind of over the time over the past 30 years, we would expect April 8th, like today, to have a certain temperature and a certain amount of moisture. And so that's kind of the average over time. But we can get dramatically different types of weather on that day, even though the climate indicates that we should be either warm or cold. And so climate is the average expected temperature or precipitation rain that you would get over time, whereas weather is just what you get. And it can be very variable over time. And so um, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Boy, you have to know a lot about science. It looks like we have another question. Does it always get windy before it snows? Someone observed that it's windier outside right now. Hmm. Yeah, and, and oftentimes it does because when we get snow coming in, it kind of indicates a change of the weather. And so that's one piece of air that's on top of us leaving and another piece of air that might be colder and snowier coming into us. And so very often before snowstorms come, we do get some wind, and that's what we call a front, a, a, a warm or a cold front. And those are often associated with wind. 
I do think we're going to see some snow Sunday, maybe as much as six inches of snow. Whoa. And so we'll see a change in the weather. Um, so, yeah, look forward to some more wind on, on Saturday. We call these transition days when you go from warm and sunny and then some cold and snow is coming in. There's going to be like one day between those two events, and those are often very windy days, and we call those transition days between the warm and the cold weather. Really good question. All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and turn it back to Mark now to finish us up for this session. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Jeff. Well, Anna and Lisa, thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our activity. If you'd like to learn more about weather, the atmosphere, the sun, or Earth system science, you can visit our websites. They're free and open, and they have a ton of resources for you to learn at home. Tim's going to put up in the chat um, those links so that you can go out to them and find more to do once we're offline. We also have that on our Facebook page as well. If you'd like to follow us there, that'll give you additional virtual programming days and times. This is our website here, and you can see that it's got elementary, middle, uh, how to be a scientist, and even videos on all the topics that I just suggested about the Earth. So if you use that URL in your chat or that link, it should take you to this page. And from there, you can literally go to many, many more places to learn. We want to thank you for your time and let's make sure we have no last second questions. I think we're doing good. Awesome. Oh, and uh, someone Go does ahead, want to Jim. know if we've recorded, if there's a recording of this session, guess what? This session was recorded today. So um, uh, we I don't know where we'll be able to make this available, but uh, please check back with at our website for uh, the opportunity to see it again. Or you could just join us, maybe you can join us again for our next session, again, looking on the website uh, to find out when we'll be doing this again. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm jumping in real quick. This is Tiffany and I'm entering my Hi, email address. So for, particularly for the person who didn't, um, or who wasn't set up, you can email me and I'll get, the video to you before we we do have to figure out how we're going to post it or where we're going to post it but i'm happy to um connect with you over email and we can figure it out there you go great well again thanks everyone if you have all the information you need have a great day and we hope to see you again soon bye bye now We cover everyone? Uh, I did. I'm going to stop the recording.